This is the CLT, a safe place for you and me. Possibly the best show in the Queen City that's not on TV. Hello, everybody. We are live on Instagram. I'm Tiffany Blackman. I'm your host and reporter for Charlotte MLS. That's an awkwardly placed mirror over my shoulder. Now that I'm sitting here, it does look quite weird. Um, it's got a horse reflection in it from a picture that I hung up myself. If you uh, have any name suggestions for the host, horse, excuse me, let me know, but I digress. Um, Anyway, <laughs> glad you guys are joining us. Hello. Um, I'm really excited as I always am every week. We've had so many great guests be able to join us on the show and we've got another one for you tonight. I'm gonna hop on over to this little guest waiting room. See if I can patch him through if it wants to work. Yes. <laughs> Hello. I was sweating. You have no idea. Why well, you thought I was gonna flake on you or what? I don't know. I mean, I, I did my due diligence. Like, I know who you are, but I also reached out to some sources that gave oh, me some some inside information. But wait, I have yeah. to give you the proper introduction. Everyone, Keith Pierce is here, <laughs> former MLS, former USMNT star. I mean, okay, we also know you as a host for Copa 90, and you're also a fashion icon. So... <laughs> Um, which is your favorite hat? Because you wear a lot of different ones. Oh, um, you know, it's funny because the, the, the headshot that I have, which I realize the importance of headshots doesn't look like me anymore. Because <laughs> I had blonde hair. And when I, when I, re, when I reposted it, uh, when you guys put it up, somebody was like, you need a new headshot. And I was like, headshots take a lot of time. And a friend of mine did that. And I was like, I guess I do need new headshots because it looks nothing like me. You get a completely, this is like the, um, you know, expectations versus reality uh, type of thing. You get this, you know, bleached blonde haired guy and now I've got, you know, dark brown hair and the shaved head and stuff. So I don't it know really what- threw me off. I didn't yeah. know, I didn't know who you were at first. Oh, sorry. No, I don't, <laughs> listen, if you want to call me a, a USMNT star, I'll take that. Uh, no one's ever said that before, for sure. <laughs> Come on. Um, that, like, you know, I def I played with the national team, but but star is a, a rare thing that I get, but I'll take that. And then um, fashion icon, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think, you know, maybe- Oh, you're downplaying that because everyone talked about your fashion. Really? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I, 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 I guess it's hard right now because I spend all my time wearing probably the same clothes every day, <laughs> day after day after day that I feel like maybe I lost that edge or I lost that part of me because- uh, you know, even I, I'm up in Northern California right now and I, I packed like, you know, two pairs of shorts and, and like four shirts and I was like, these will be fine. You're uh, fine. Business yeah, casual so. there anyway, right? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. How are you? I'm good. My shirt's really wrinkled, but I planned for that because I knew I'd be like cropped. Okay. Although when I was waiting for you, everyone saw my full shirt. So I was like trying to hide it behind my, my notebook. It's really you bad. Know what, you know what's crazy right now? Because I'm doing a lot of like, you know, everybody. It, communicating via video and some video platforms you use have wide angle shots <laughs> and so like i'll be like oh you know it's just a shirt i'll be fine and then I'll, I'll look there and it'll be like when i actually click on me like pin me to the screen you see that like it sees everything in the background when you think it's just like <laughs> what, what you're seeing is what you get it's really deceiving and you know there's like 20 different video things that everybody's using so you just don't know how to be a uh, dressed appropriately uh, or have the, you know, your background appropriate for, for these conversations. So you set up, well, I'm the one that moved and now I've got this awkward, like I just threw a mirror up and then there's a horse picture that I hung up and now it's just hanging over my shoulder. It's quite oh, weird. The horse, yeah, the horse is looking at you. <laughs> like the horse Mona Lisa, like it's always watching you. That's, um, and maybe I'll stay here. This will be my new setup now. Cause it could be that, yeah. That so the yeah, wow. Yeah, the, the, you're with me. It's a lot to take in with that mirror. There's just like it's, it's almost like, did you know the horse is there? But at least you've acknowledged it. So now, now I've acknowledged it. In case you got distracted, now I got distracted. Guys, we will be taking your questions um, throughout this. And actually, producer Ryan Bailey, who did, you know, he was the setup for this for getting you on. He asked, "What's on your bookshelf?" Or I guess maybe, "What interesting books do you have on oh. your shelf?" So my, this is, I'm at my, my, my parents' house up in the mountains in Northern California. And these are all, uh, for the most part, like 90% books on, on theology. 
really the full the full uh spectrum of theology that whole whatever that range is as far as in wide as that can go is what's on that bookshelf there's another bookshelf here everything from we've got uh the torah club on torah on 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 disc we've got um everything from yeah everything on theology from from islam to christianity to uh judaism to mysticism to all kinds of let me see if i can find another uh creative one to to show uh it's just it's, it's a lot there's a lot, got you know, every... a lot we've got we've got uh druid magic we've got uh animal speak we've got uh you know there's there's just a uh Celtic Golden Dawn. It, it, it's, it's just the full range of, of the full of, range of uh, all of it. Like this is a, 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 I think the word is right, a theologian's paradise in here. You know, the full yes. spectrum of education on 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 everything in theology. So that's what's in in the background. I can promise you that I've I've many times told my dad to give me a you know a list of things to read, and I'm more of like a, a you need to get to the point type of reader. You know, like yeah. can you you know like where's the action? You know. Uh, and most of those are very deep uh, educational books that I usually go like, I'm going to read this. And I pack like five books for a trip and then go back from that trip, having not opened any of them. That's crazy. Um, I'm going to try to do an awkward transition and bring Great. it back. Let's see. Let's go back to fashion because fashion is very, you can be an intellect that's into fashion. So mm -hmm. if you were to design a Charlotte MLS kit, what would it look like? Ooh. Ooh. I put you on the um, spot, I know. Do you have a favorite color? Yes, I like, I like, I like greens. I like shades of green. I knew that, That's, see, I really did. Yeah, you, you, you came so prepared, you know what I mean? It's like one <laughs> quick internet search and, 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 and you nailed it. Um, I like shades of green, I like shades of blue. Uh, I, I'm, I, I, I like simple things, you know, I, I, I think, that sometimes we try to overcomplicate. Uh, I, I actually, one thing that I would really like is, is to go with a vintage look, like a throwback look, like vintage soccer is one thing that I really like. So I like right now with, the, you know, MLS and, and, and Adidas sponsorship. I like the old three stripes on the shoulders. I like a lot of that, uh, like paying homage to, to the old days. So I, that's probably the way that I would start within the design, but, but think very simply. Someone's asking, do you like mint green? I'm not, a, I'm, I'm, I'm not against mint green. There's been a few, I'm trying to think of where I saw mint green recently in terms of a, a color of something. And, and I really liked it. Uh, but, but generally speaking, like, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm like an advocate of mint green, but why not? <laughs> you know? Are you an advocate of Charlotte? Have you been here, spent a lot of time here? I, I have been to Charlotte um, quite a few times. I've done a few runs around uh, the big stadium uh during my time there i try to that was like m me trying to remind myself that i got to keep working out but um <laughs> don't we all <laughs> yeah, we, we, we used to do uh quite a bit of work with with continental tire um who are based in south carolina but but near charlotte and and uh so we would stay in charlotte as an excuse to to kind of have a good time in charlotte for a couple of days so i've been down there a, a few times and and actually really like charlotte a lot so as we're gearing up, um, the MLS though is getting set to restart. So what do you make of all that? And are, are you excited? I, I, I am excited. I think uh, obviously I'm really excited that NWSL is coming back this weekend. Yeah. Just like yeah. that first taste of domestic soccer. Uh, and then with MLS as well, just seeing everyone back in again, like my world was living on this like rhythm of MLS soccer and now it feels out of it to where, you know, my, my schedule was built on MLS soccer matches. And then there was, you know, Premier League and Bundesliga and all these things filled in. Uh, and then once MLS went away, like I forgot about Premier League coming back and Bundesliga coming back and these types of things, like I've had to kind of retrain my body again. So this will help me to get back in the mode of like, soccer's on TV, you gotta pay attention uh, and get me back into that zone again. So I'm excited. And you mentioning all these different leagues, like you're obviously well-traveled, a well-traveled player. Um, where did your soccer journey begin? How did you get into the sport? Um, I grew up in a part of Northern California in the Central Valley. Um, it's called uh, a place called Modesto, and it had a very large um, multicultural immigrant population. Right, it's an agriculture land, so you have a lot of um, Portuguese, Italian, Mexican farmers. 
Uh, and so there was always a culture of soccer where I grew up, weirdly during the time. Um, and so soccer was part of our, our lives. And it was obviously one of the first sports that you could play as a group and with your friends. But hanging out with friends and at friends' houses, soccer was a big thing, which was, again, this is, you know, 80s and 90s, unusual for, for in, in general. And so because of that, because not my parents, because my, you know, if you ask my parents now, they're experts, but back then they had no idea. You know, they were like shaving the tip of the baseball shoe off <laughs> so that it becomes like a, a, a soccer shoe. Um, but, you know, other kids that I grew up with from all, all parts of the Middle East, uh, Central South America, um, in their home, soccer was, was a big part of their lives. And that, I think, instilled uh, a, a love for me because my friends liked it. And you always like what your friends like when, you know, that whole, you know, peer-to-peer -peer thing. Were you watching yesterday? Are you happy for Liverpool? Of of all <laughs> people that I'm, I'm actually like, there are there are Liverpool fans that I, I that I cannot stand. But in general, the Liverpool story and the you know the, the the people and their history. I'm getting a hamstring cramp right now from You're working right. out. Oh my god! <laughs> That's the first oh. time this has happened. I'm so thirsty right now, and I'm getting a cramp. I'm so dehydrated. This is not like this is not a good look from me uh, in terms. Do you of, like, have anything that. to drink? Do you have? Do you uh, need to go get some water? No, look, like I, I had, I've had meetings. I've had meetings down here in this office all day, and these are like all my empty drinks <laughs> that I just bring down. Um, but I'll get back to the to, to the to the answer. I'm really happy for for Liverpool fans because you know the history and the story of Liverpool is so great, and they're one of those clubs that that. You know, if you're Everton or something like that, you could, you you would not like them, but but I just like them in general. You know, I, I put Man City in this category of like in the U.S. anyway, kind of new fans. So like, you can't really be mad when they win. They spent a bunch of money. They built an amazing team. But Liverpool has the story and this history that I'm like, okay, this is great. I like that. I can get I can get behind this. And the majority of Liverpool fans that I know, I like, and so that's always a good thing as well. Yeah, it was pretty cool to watch yesterday. Um, we do have a question I see coming in from Brandon. How much do you work out? I mean, obviously not enough. Uh, I, I'm still, uh, I'm, I'm afraid to like go back under this desk because I'm going to start cramping. Don't. <laughs> okay, I'm going straight, to straighten this leg and then I'll answer that, that, that question, okay? Take Hold your on. time. All right, sorry. You're not going to no. be able to use this video if you're keeping it. Yeah, like, no, we're going to post it. I was, I was really like, don't feel bad because I was really awkward at the beginning because awkward is just what I, it's like natural to me. So this is nothing compared to my intro when we started. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. So, I mean, I, I could feel it coming on to and I was like, what do I do here? Uh, and then it just grabbed my hamstring. I work out actually right now. Uh, I work out every day of the week. Um, I've been doing a mix of kind of hit training, running. Um, when I'm when I'm back down in LA where I usually live, I live close to the beach, so I like to run on the shoreline. But with you know different closures and things happening, the shoreline became very crowded, so I stopped going going there. Um, but I, right now, it's it's the most that I, I've I've probably worked out since since retiring, and that's every day. Usually, I, I like to play soccer twice a week with some former pros in LA and things like that, and, and then I can't walk for like two days, so <laughs> that's like twice a week. Um, but right now, it's like kind of less impact, so every day, you know. I'm that's how you know it's working when you're when you're really sore. That's that's what happens. Yeah. Another yeah. question just came in: the toughest place to play as a player. Man. I mean, during my experience in, 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 I'll give one for my time in, in Europe, obviously, uh, when I was playing Bundesliga, you know, away to Dortmund was crazy loud. It was the first time, you know, I played a national team game in there, but it was the first time having been playing most of my career in Denmark at that point. It was the first time I remember being in a stadium where it was so loud that you couldn't communicate normally. Like you, my, my voice was gone after the game because you're screaming, trying to like, you know, you realize the advantages that you have when stadiums are smaller, where you can actually talk and use, you know, move people around to, to make the game easier. It was the first time I just felt alone. Um, and then playing with the club team there, that was really rough. But harder than anything is qualifying away games in Central America. That, you know, I didn't get a chance to play in Azteca, uh, but I, I've gone down there as a fan since. But playing, like qualifying in CONCACAF away is, it's more than just fan noise it's 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 heat it's atmosphere it's like you feel so far from home and feel so, such a lack of control that it's, it's definitely the hardest places to play i was gonna ask about the crowd so and you mentioned the other factors that probably would make make it one of the toughest places to play but i mean when you have so many people against you um are chanting i mean what does that feel like yeah it, it's 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 you know we 
before or early MLS, for example, the, the advantages of home field used to be elevation, turf versus grass, temper, temperatures, right? So playing Canada during, you know, late in the year or early in the year versus playing down in the middle of summer in Houston or Dallas. Like those types of things were, were where the advantages happened, right? But now the next generation has, has, has arrived where fan atmospheres are where the real home field advantage is. Like fans can dictate the energy, right? When it, and when a, when a club has a fan base that's in tune with the players on the field, it's like this ebb and flow that happens where if you're on the other side of that and things start going well for the home team, you feel so far from home. You feel like they're slowly leaning on you and you're going to like, be like, okay, I, you know, you can feel something happening. It's like, you can feel energy shifts in the stadium. And the same when your home team, you feel that when that, when that fan base props you up and that noise is, is, is humming and they're all in tune, you feel like, you can see in other, the other team's faces like, okay, let's just try to get out of here uh, with a point or let's try to survive here. You know that you've got them where you want them. You got some people excited because people are already talking about our future supporter section going. Um, I did see a walk, talk, football question go by and they asked if you ever got distracted or tripped or anything while doing that. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, as, as like a, a, a preface, walk, talk, football was a walking interview where um, I would have um, our videographer with a gimbal walking backwards and I would walk forward. So I could always see where we were going. Um, and there was times like I'd go around the corner and we, you know, as the cameras got smaller and smaller, it was easier for, for him or her to like turn around and sign and know what's going around them. But there was plenty of times where the videographer at least was walking backwards and I would guide him straight into something that would then be like camera up falling on their backside, you know, which is wrong of me. Uh, and I'm sure I tripped over a few curbs and steps, you know, all of that for the most part was in New York City, which has, you know, plenty of sidewalks where you can, you know, uneven uh, pavement. So, yeah, there was, there was plenty of times that, that things went wrong. Is there a most memorable spot that you played in or that you went to go, you know, cover a story, you know, back with Copa 90? Yeah, I would say the the... One, one of the ones that's most memorable is one going to Azteca as, as a fan. I always wanted to play there with the national team. And, and, and during kind of the, the couple cycles that I was in, didn't get that chance. But I went down and did a story uh, with Copa 90 at, in, um, at Atletico Nacional in Colombia. And it was around their Recopa Sudamericana final where they were playing against Chapecoense. And this was after they had given Chapecoense the title um, after their kind of tragic, uh, not kind of, their extremely tragic plane crash. Uh, they fielded a new team, and then the um, so you you have two tournaments there, like Copa Lib and the Copa Sudamericana. Those two teams play each other in like a Super Cup. So they won the uh, Atlético Nacional won one, and then they get they gifted one to Chapecoense, who they were going to play in the final. And then they they faced each other in sort of the 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 final of the two cups, and it was a really emotional uh, experience that had a lot of elements where they were bonded by this this brotherhood of of of, of having going to play each other when the you know the plane crashed on their way to play each other and it was just a really emotional experience to tap into colombian culture one and and how they're trying to move past sort of the the hollywoodization of the narco trafficking and so we embedded ourselves with the fans there and i know it's kind of a a lot to take in but i it was the closest that i had felt you know we were in the fan sections we were behind the scenes and we were just embedded in this culture and it was one of the times that i felt like this is what it's like to be a fan in a supporter section that is large and it's loud and it's a family and it's, it's an identity and it's all of these things. And there was so many other factors that went into this, but just getting a chance to do that was, was a really special experience that, that I don't know if I'll ever have a chance to do again. That's really cool. And the fact that you, I guess, got to be influenced as a fan from that aspect. Um, the question here too is who has influenced you the most? Um, and I'm, I'm sure they're speaking about, you know, as a player. Um, as a player, I was, I was heavily influenced, you know, kind of through phases of, of my career. When I became a, a left fullback, Roberto fullback, Carlos yeah. was someone that I always looked up to in terms of, you know, kind of revolutionizing, Brazilians revolutionizing that de defensive position that made it fun instead of just being a defender all the time, which isn't that fun. Uh, I love know, getting playing defense, that. so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I like playing a defense long enough to get the ball and then go the other way. Um, <laughs> But, but, you know, that Toby Jones was like an idol of mine growing up. You know, I used to have like 
braids and you know things like that when I was like a child uh wanting to be him posters that sort of thing and me and me and my best friend at the time you know he named his dog Kobe and which I don't know if that's a compliment or not but I would you know if you asked Kobe who I play soccer with now he probably wouldn't like that but like all of these things like a big part of my my my, my childhood and then you know Roberto Carlos growing up and then and then Ronaldo being one where the, the original Ronaldo R9 being the you know start of the YouTube era where you're just like, I want to watch this guy all day long with his like kind of highlight reels were, were inspirational to me. Uh, so you still play with guys now. That's what you're talking about earlier. You just mentioned Kobe then. Uh, who were some of the other guys you're playing with and who still got it? Well, Kobe doesn't have it anymore. No, I'm just <laughs> he, 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 Kobe's the one that he he's, we get put against each other at times. And then it's just, we just talk crap to each other for the entire time every time we turn the ball over it's kind of a knock on doesn't have it anymore type of thing so he's one of my favorite <laughs> ones to play with um but we have we we have a lot of people come out there um Stu holden's out there regularly uh we have who else steve nash plays with us it's their game i i, I just yeah. moved to, to to la and they, they already had that game going a little over a year ago uh, a number of um, NWSL players, women's national team players come out during the off seasons and play. We've had, you know, uh, Alex Morgan, uh, Tobin Heath, uh, Kristen Press. A lot of people just come out because it's, it's actually, you know, for what you can get a, a pretty decent run uh, in LA and, and, and a good workout, an excuse to, to, to touch the ball. So and Mario Melchior. Mario Melchior is another one, ex-Chelsea player. Uh, he lives out in LA and he comes out and plays. So there's a lot, lot of ex-pros from around the world that will kind of jump in when they're in town. So do you get to bring friends? Because we're like friends now, right? So you get to bring people, like if I go to LA and this is still I going. Mean, you, you knew I liked green and you wore green. So, you know, that I mean, counts? That's, what friends, that's what friends do. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, an, it's, it's funny because it's an open game, but the open game over the last few months had, had gotten abused, right? So people started the 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 quality started being diluted, right? If you, if you come and you're new, you know what it's like to play in a new pickup game. You gotta, you gotta show a little bit, you gotta work a little hard. You gotta play a little more defense than, than some of the people that have been there a while. We all have to go through it. And then it started getting where we had two group chats. There's a group of French guys that we play against and guys and girls, and then uh, same on ours, guys and girls uh, in our group chat. And those started having leaks. And then we started having like 30, 40 people show up and we had to kill the group chat, start a new one and whatever. So, my, my, my answer is yes, the invites <laughs> exist, but, uh, you know, there, there's a vetting process that has to go through the group, you know, we'll probably look at your background. I know you played. Um, and so, you know, how often you play now, we'll, we'll go through like a vetting process. And then we'll okay. Okay. I'll hold you yeah. to that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was my question, but we did have another question come in. Um, current player that you wish you could have played with. Current player that I wish I could have played with, um, I mean, to, to make it simple, I would say within the national team, a current player that I wish I could have played with uh, would be Christian Pulisic um, or Gio Reyna, both up and coming players. It would have been fun to be have them in my cycle, uh, being mostly 2005 to 2012. But that that group of players of you know in the Landon Donovan era, so to speak would have been great to see him playing with, with Landon, him playing with, with other players that would add another dynamic to our team. Would have been really cool to see uh, a player like that uh, and a DeMarcus Beasley on the other side, like see those two players uh, match up. It would have been, would have been really fun. We have Ulysses that's asking any thoughts on Pulisic in the last two games. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on his goal yeah. uh, from, from, from yesterday. One, if that happened in MLS, that would be on every highlight reel of how bad MLS is and how bad the defenders are. But because it's Man City and these guys are on like 200 grand a week, no one wants to criticize them. But two players run into each other and all they got to do is hold up Christian Pulisic. And he did really yeah. well to, to like free up some space. But you don't need to go and, and, and dive in. And then unbelievable finish. But it's the kind of thing that, that looks so easy because you blame the defenders on bad positioning or, or, you know, diving in and whatever. But like to free up that much space, create his moment, and then finish it after it all just shows the, the, the quality of player that he is. So with Pulisic and with, um, with Gio then, I mean, how bright is the future then for, for the national team? Uh, it's the 
and and this probably gets me into trouble because it's it's never a, a good thing word of warning to compare generations uh yeah. but it's the most talented pool of players that we've seen it's also the their the structure of the men's national team is as dysfunctional as it's ever been in terms of who's the leader who is carrying that team what's the tradition what does it mean all those things i'm not saying i'm questioning any of that but it, we are in a transitional period uh and so i'm really excited about that i'm excited for players like geo to get more games i think he just signed a new contract uh to get those experiences to become leaders in the national team as well to lead this generation forward because they need some from outspoken leaderships they need to set a standard within themselves they need to re reset on what it means to play for the national team and and you know what it takes to qualify things like that that are that are just different right so i'm super excited uh to see them develop over the next period but i know the window of qualification is coming quick and the new qualification um type oh type not type but like whatever the qualification rules are um are going to come out soon it's not going to be easy so um but i'm excited i'm excited to see them rise to the challenge what was your experience like, your time like playing for the national team? Weirdly, I never felt that comfortable playing in the national team. Like I never had the confidence that I had in the club team level. And that's, that may be normal, maybe not, but I, I never, I never felt my best on the field. Fortunately, I was able to get um, 35 caps, which if you ask most haters, they'll say it's because there's no other good players out there. <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, you know, but the camaraderie of that group is what I really, really enjoyed. And looking back, I knew it was something special. Those were, you know, when you came into camp and, you know, I spent half my career abroad, it was like a chance to get together again with you, with your family. And that part of it was, was amazing. And that's what made it so much better on the field. You know, I, I may not have felt the most comfortable, but I knew what I was doing on the field. I knew I had around me. I knew that there was a lot of trust. So it was just an amazing experience getting to travel the world, playing some big games, um, have front row seats on some games that I didn't play, have the best seat in the house for some games, you know, all of Confederation or all of Confederation Cup in South Africa between before 2010 and 29, when we went to the final and lost to Brazil. I had a front row seat, you know, floor seats, uh, floor seats to the Lakers kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, it was a lot of great experiences. It, it was amazing. But a fullback is very valuable. What, oh, what yeah. do you look for in fullbacks now? What does it take to be able to, to hold that position? Well, I think it depends, right? If you look at like a Serginho Dest, he's going to be an attacking fullback. They're going to overlook his deficiencies as a defender because he's going to scale to a club that's going to have the ball more often than not, right? He's going to go from Ajax to probably a Bayern Munich or a Barcelona or something where if he plays, he's going to be part of a team that's going to dictate the flow and the tempo. That is a rare case, right? The fundamentals of a defender have to, one, be able to defend, right? <laughs> and well, I think we, we, we went from being like defensive first to now being attacking first defenders uh, to now trying to find that balance, right? If you can instill that into uh, the players, obviously we have a lot of really good athletes now coming out to play at, at fullback positions. But I, that, that defensive foundation, I think, is really important. And one that I learned uh, in college playing under Clyde Charles was like the foundation of my, what I think allowed me to go to the next level is because I was always one of the fastest. I was always, you know, in terms of charting, you know, highest vertical, fastest in the different types of things and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I needed to convert that into a, a skill set that, that could be relied upon. And so that foundation of defending, I think, is a really important thing that we're now looking past because we want to have, you know, players that can run run the touch lines all day long or or the good recovery speeds and so they can make up for mistakes. I think that piece is still missing of that that foundation of defending. See, and we're building our team. So we'll just, we'll take these tips from you, you know, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we'll yeah, I'll send you my, I'll send you my email for an invoice after. <laughs> oh, I'll give you a post-dated check, but we'll, you know, we'll handle that later. Uh, can we, we'll be able to get you to Charlotte when we are playing. We'll be able, to, will we be able to get you here for a game? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I can't, I can't wait. Um, uh, if, for everything to come. I mean, the, the standard is set so high now, what you yeah. expect from fan bases that I think Charlotte now has the window and obviously, you know, North Carolina being a hotbed for, for youth soccer and therefore soccer culture in general in the way that the U.S. has sort of been shaped. I think, you know, the expectation is high for them in terms of the fan, the, the atmosphere and everything like that, that I wouldn't want to miss, you know, uh, any of any of the big uh, first games and, and then, you know, hopefully a long successful future.
And okay, what else do you have coming up next besides having to stretch your hamstring? Are you working on anything? Do you have any other projects? Yeah, so in November, uh, we launched a new project in the US called Four Soccer Ventures. And um, Four Soccer Ventures has two uh, platform businesses. One of them is focused on the youth landscape. So it's a strategic investment in clubs, leagues, tournaments, and programs with the idea of trying to uh, improve and elevate the overall youth soccer experience. So that's trying to stabilize costs, you know, improve transparency, really improve the experience so that if you're a player that might not be a scholarship level athlete or a professional level athlete, you still have a positive experience. Your parents still have a positive experience. And a lot of that is accessibility, affordability, things like that. Um, so that we are growing that, that pool of fans, right? I don't want to have to go and find you because you studied abroad your senior year and now you're a fan because of that experience, but you had this very negative soccer experience growing up. Like we want to increase that pool of fans that, that build that soccer culture in the youth that if they don't make the A team and they're not on track tracking for that 1% of top players, that they have a positive experience. And then on the other side uh, of our business called the Soccer Collective, um, it's again an, an investment, um, a controlling interest investment sort of portfolio or house of brands that we're, we're, we're buying and building uh, that's focused on trying to drive sustained relevance. So making the game cool over time, right? We see this as the decade of soccer and we want that, to, we, knowing that we have 26 uh, World Cup, 27, hopefully the women, 28 Olympics, uh, there is a huge opportunity to grow and sustain the, the, the relevance of the game here. And so we're focusing that on the other side. So pretty, pretty deeply consumed uh, in that world, but, but one that's exciting when I was with, you know, to give it context at, at Copa 90, we had a very global approach, right? And we focused yeah. on the U.S. on some things, but it was, it was a globalized approach. And I felt like I, you know, my mission was done there from a global standpoint. And then really wanted to focus in on, on the U.S. and North America in general and really have a touch and feel that's focused on, on the U.S. And something leading me probably to more, you know, uh, a local type of thing. But my focus now being in the North American landscape. And it's been fun so far to really kind of get my hands dirty on, on, on the landscape of soccer and the complexities of that in, in, in the U.S. Well, surely you bring so a wealth of knowledge um, and so valuable and anything to keep elevating the game, especially coming from someone like you, is, is awesome. So uh, we'll definitely be on the lookout for those. And just to sneak in one more question, because I don't want to let this one go by. Someone asked, what tips or drills do you recommend for defenders? Oh, man, that is tough. Uh... I mean, am I really the one you want to take advice from? Uh, someone asked, someone asked, you yeah. know, so okay. I just. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, tips for defenders. Uh, I mean. Or drills. Tips or drills for defenders. It, I mean, I, I. it's so hard to think beyond kind of like yeah. our COVID world right now of like training yeah. by yourself from just like become a striker, you know, <laughs> go, go and shoot. <laughs> no, uh, we're ending this right now. Striker. <laughs> no, uh, okay, but like you know, it, a lot of that is is you know small channels. If you have somebody to to, to play with when when things are safe wherever you're, you're you're living, is is to work on those one on ones using, you know, the space to your advantage and learning to read the body language of a player on the ball and on how to move them, you know, make them unbalanced and when to you know press and when to drop off type of things. And it's obviously a lot. It's easy for me to say those things, but it's it's hard to think of one particular drill that can improve you. Uh, as a defender, I'd say the biggest thing is if you're a defender, you want to build the parameters of a defender and find the things that you can enjoy in those uh, parameters, right? Find your creativity. Just because you're a defender doesn't mean it's not a creative position. Whether you're a center back, left back, right back, you want to build those parameters of what it takes to be good at that and then explore your creativity and explore um, – who you are within that position. So find the fun, enjoy it. And if you were once a striker, that was really fun to you and you've been moved to a new position like a defender, which happens so often, that doesn't mean you can't have fun anymore. It doesn't mean there's not any joy in it. Like you said, you like being a defender uh, and you have to find what it is that you like about that uh, in order to become good at it. Because if you don't like it, 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 it's really hard to become good at it. See, you went from having nothing to say to having valuable information to share with all of us. So, no. you know a thing uh, or two. I'm, 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 I'm full of nonsense. I can talk, you know, you know, stuff that you can poke holes in all day long, but no, I, I'd say that's the best that, the, you know, I, I try to avoid the whole, like, have fun type of thing, but I, I really think that is one thing that's missing in the youth soccer landscape is the fun, right? There's so much pressure in youth soccer now to win tournaments and get the scholarship and all these things that fun goes missing. And 
especially when you're a kid that might not start or, or on your team that you were once a, a, now you moved up to a bigger team or a better team and you don't play and, you know, finding those parameters where you can be creative and be yourself and, and, and have fun are the most important things. And I, I you know, I, I'll, I'll repeat that, you know, hundred times out of a hundred being one of the most important things in, in playing soccer. Keith, look for that check uh, in the mail in a couple of months. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I will. I will. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. <laughs> thank you for having me. I, I was a good time chatting. I had a great time too. We'll see you soon. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Um, that was fun. And I tap danced at the beginning a little bit, but thank you guys for bearing with me. Um, but wow, what valuable information that he was able to share with all of us. So we will get this posted and we will hopefully see you again next week because we have another great guest. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night and a good weekend. This is the CLT, a safe place for you and me. Possibly the best show in the Queen City that's not on TV.